I'm Kelly and I'm here with my friend Susan from Shady Grove Gardens. She's a grower here in Boone, North Carolina. Susan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do up at Shady Grove Gardens? All right. Uh, well, we're growers and florist and we've been doing it. This is year 31. 31. Wow. And uh, so we do, we grow our flowers and use them for all our wedding designs. Okay. So uh, we grow well over 300 different varieties, mm -hmm. and we sell them to people like Kelly. Like me, actually, to me. Yes, <laughs> and florists. So I'm like nodding like, oh, yeah. this is new information, but I of course know this because Susan is one of the growers here in Boone, so um, a lot of the flowers that you saw whenever we were doing um, bunches of weddings and things like that, some of those things came from Susan's farm, mm -hmm. so yeah. And we sell directly to brides as well. Okay, fantastic. So before you started doing weddings and doing flowers as cut, you have a little bit of experience mm -hmm. in landscape design and then mm -hmm. also tell us a little bit about your education. Uh, well, I have a master's in biology and I, I have a naturalist degree and a botany degree. And then I did landscape gardening uh -huh. for about 20 years. And then we slowly transitioned into having a flower farm. Okay. Um, so that's all we do now. We have a flower farm and a nursery. We grow all our own seedlings, and I'm the grower, seedling, office mouse yeah. uh, designer, Yeah. and Brent, my husband, is the uh, main grower and farm mm -hmm. manager. Yeah, because they've got some flowers at the their kind of main place where all of the seedlings and office work takes place, and they have a beautiful, um, you call it the peak, mm -hmm. that's out, just beautiful mountain views. I mean one of the prettiest farms that I've ever been to. Fantastic views, great location. Um, so yeah, all of that then happens out at the peak. Tell me a little bit about that naturalist degree. What What's included in that? Uh, well, it's from Appalachian State. Okay. And back then, we just did a lot of field work. So it was all uh, ornithology, mycology, which is mushrooms. You're gonna have to tell me what. Um, <laughs> So mushrooms, mushrooms and okay. fungus, you know. So it was all field work as opposed to like learning how to do uh, lab okay. sorts of things. Okay, sure. So, but I but I also took uh, plant physiology and uh, things like that. As yeah, well. yeah, fantastic. Well, when it comes to hellebores, um, there are a few things that are really great about um, that we wanted to share about keeping them hydrated. And one of them actually goes back to some of this like plant physiology and some of those things mm -hmm. that Susan's been talking about. And one of them is keeping the water that you're using having quite a full uh, vase of water. Mm -hmm. Because having all of this water in here creates pressure that then pushes the water up, up through the stems. So that's one of the first things about hellebore hydration, and that would apply to a wide variety of plants, yes. actually. Mm -hmm. So it's great to have some deep water whenever you're working with hellebores. We have several different types of hellebores here, and um, Susan really loves the ones that have their necks up oh, because they sweet. are a lot easier to use in arrangements. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the um, ones that you brought today? All right, uh, this one is actually a seedling uh, from my other hellebores around the yard. Uh, I will point out that it takes four years for them okay. at least to bloom, uh, so, and they don't move terribly well. Um, so I love this one, and it's in a pot, so it's going probably back in my yard okay. somewhere. Okay, it's ready to go out. Uh -huh. This one is one that you can buy on the market. It's called Winter Thriller. There is a mix, and this one is pink... Uh, ballerina and it's a really nice ruffled double but it does hang down a little bit so uh -huh. Kelly might be able to tell you how to solve that problem. <laughs> yeah well whenever they have the kind of that natural facing like that their um, heads are moving down sometimes what I'll do is take a, a branch like for example um, spirea and quince are blooming at a similar time as the hellebore and they both have like nice branchy stems. So what I'll do is, you know, put this one, you know, since this is a short stem, I'd put this kind of lower in the arrangement, but I would just like hook its little neck here um, onto one of those branches or prop it over one of the branches so that it, you know, you could get that um, effect. And sometimes too, seeing the, the backs of the stems and the silhouettes that you get, it just all depends what, what the point is and what the purpose of that flower that you're using is in your arrangement because this, you know, even pointing down like this, I think would be really 
lovely depending on the lines and the shapes that you're using in your arrangement. But if you have some that are, you know, a little bit droopier, you can prop them up using those mm -hmm. branches and things. So love this pink ballerina. Um, another one that's on the market right now, this one's called Pink Frost, and this is one I got a couple of these at Lowe's um, had them. I like the stiff stem on that one. Yeah, very hardy, and that's what as Susan as soon as Susan picked it up, she said, "Yeah, this is a really hardy one." And um, several years ago, I visited Pine Knot Farms, um, which is where some of the the research in this book took place, and I cut several of several different types from their garden. They were so gracious to let me do this, do that, and this was the variety that really held up well comparatively. I mean, this went on for almost a month, I think, whenever I, you know, had it that first time. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really great one if you're looking uh, to add some cuts to your garden. But really, um, most hellebores, I, th I think, do hold up quite well. The mm -hmm. um, All of the uh, progress that they've made and breeding and all those kinds of things, they're a great strong plant. So Anyway, this um, this one I just cut from the garden right before we came in to record today. So I'm going to give it a quick snip, exposing as much of this area as I can. And then I'm going to have some quick dip here from Floral Life. And I'm just going to do a one, two, three. And then I'm going to put it in that deep water. And then same thing with this. And this one, um, I'm not 100% sure on what exactly this is called, but I got it here at Pine Knot Farms if you really love it and you're looking for one that's similar. It's a very unique, um, it doesn't have the picketty like this ballerina. I love mm -hmm. the little spots. Um, but this is more of a gradation in, in mm -hmm. color um, from white to this just really rich burgundy. And the back sides of the petals are so lovely too. And a double like the ballerina that we have here. And most of the uh, hellebores on the market now are uh, hybrids. So you just have to go by variety name and which ones you like. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so those ones are in there and they're ready to go. So quick dip is one way that you can process your hellebore. And another way that you can do it, kind of an old fashioned technique. We just wanted to show mm -hmm. a couple different techniques that you could try out um, is to take in, Jesse, we'll just get a close up of this if we can here. We want to get water up into the stem as quickly as possible. So we're just doing a, a very small, gentle, super gentle scoring of the stem. And that is also done with tulips occasionally. And that just helps them get water up into that, what's it called, the xylem mm -hmm. in the yeah, in the xylem, in case you have a stem that's sealed off at the base somehow, that allows more water uptake. And if there's air bubbles in there, like an embolism comes mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So there we go. So and tell us a little bit about how the quick dip works, because it serves a somewhat kind of a similar purpose when it comes it to the air bubbles and the embolism, things like that. In theory, you shouldn't have to do this uh, on your own cuts, but with the ones that are shipped in especially, mm -hmm. uh, if you have them wilted, the quick dip, what it does is it changes the surface tension of the liquid and the water that you're trying to get taken up. So it's acidic and it, it's just, that's all you need is that few seconds okay. to change that uh, surface pH. So the acid breaks down the, the, the kind of the surface, surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it pops those bubbles and mm -hmm. lets lets everything flow through freely. And that's similar to what you're doing with the slits. Mm -hmm. You're allowing the air bubbles to be dissolved in one way or another, mm -hmm. and you get more uptake. Okay, yeah, because sometimes with hellebores you can get those little droopy, those little droopy necks at the top, especially whenever you're shipping them in um, wholesale. And for a long time, Susan and I were just talking about how for a long time it was considered that hellebores just, you know, weren't a good cut flower. Um, and how unfortunate that we lost that, but we moved into a season where a lot of our sourcing was coming from other countries and we were doing a lot of um, shipping and planes and all those types of things. And so comparatively, in like the world of flowers, it was a little bit more complicated to get, you know, hellebores going. And because of their bloom season being whenever it's cooler, things like this, maybe flowers weren't as much in demand. So there was sort of this little period of history in the cut flower world where they, 
you know, disappeared. But whenever we were doing cut flowers using things that were in our own backyard before, you know, airplanes and all of those types of transportation methods were um, a piece of it. This is something that you'll see in um, in floral history and in art and different things. You'll see these being used. Well, the hybrids certainly have made them more popular because mm -hmm. there's nicer colors, mm -hmm. better stems. Uh, but yes, back in the 40s, when people grew their own flowers as a florist, mm -hmm. um, they used them. And then the tropics, they don't do well in the tropics. Uh -huh. They have to have that cold period. Yeah. They bloom in the snow. They're Lenten roses. Yeah. So now that there's more North American growers, mm -hmm. we have more hellebores. More hellebores. Yeah, and how lucky we are because just the variety that's available now and um, Pine Knot Farm has done so much work in pushing us forward in terms of just the interesting types and colors and, um, you know, all of the doubles and pickadees and all those beautiful gradations and the colors of the petals. I mean, it's just fantastic. They have such a, a great variety there. Um, tell us, Susan, a little bit about this, um, these little rubber band guys. Um, <laughs> we were talking about when the best time is to cut them. You know, in the summertime, we, of course, whenever it's warmer, we want to cut them early in the morning or late in the evening. But what's interesting about hellebores is they are blooming whenever it is freezing, unlike most other flowers. So you actually have to pay attention to is it frozen <laughs> <laughs> well these were cut last night at 11 o'clock at night and they were frozen solid so I had my doubts about bringing them over to Kelly uh -huh. but sure enough yep, pull every them out single one of them, them looks just bit. fine they're a little more wilty than the ones I cut the day before before the freeze but so not here's much. Day before the freeze, what we're looking at here. And this one's not too I terribly mean, much I don't, different. I don't see a huge like visible difference. What do you think? I don't. Now, what you're going to notice, is, especially if you're getting ones from your own yard, is the buds probably will never look good. They may turn brown. Or if they the, were frozen. Or the immature ones, that stem might decline mm -hmm. much faster. But the bigger ones, they will be fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, it does depend on how long they stay cold mm -hmm. and whether it's windy and they have wind chill and dehydration, mm -hmm. but a short spurt of snow or deep cold, mm -hmm. they're okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something else that's important to consider is what, and a lot of times with cuts when you're having things, if, if you're someone who's having um, things shipped to you, there is a whole life that that flower lived before it even landed at your doorstep. And so you might be doing all of the, the by the book right things to do, but still be like, these never opened or um, these just kind of, you know, whatever. They had, they had a whole life. They could have, you know, not been hydrated properly whenever they were planted in the ground. They could have mm -hmm. been malnourished. It's like, how strong was that plant before it was actually cut? Mm -hmm. And so one of the great things about hellebores, I think that, I think that they are, it's something that I think everybody should have in their, I think everybody should have these in their garden. They're very easy once you've got them in the ground. Very easy. Um, a very easy plant. And uh, tell us a little bit about when you think the best time is to cut them. Like what you would water them two days before or yeah, what about, do you think? Good, you know, just make sure it's either rained or you watered mm -hmm. about 48 hours out. Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to cut them early in the morning as long as they're not frozen. Mm -hmm. It's probably your best time and bring them in immediately and put them straight into water. Mm -hmm. uh, where you could go wrong is leaving them lay around like I did with the one. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but, but even so, like look at how, look at how, um, I don't remember exactly which one it was. Uh, but it's the one I cut with the from. knife. <laughs> oh yes, this one. It's this one. So this one accidentally got left out overnight in freezing cold weather and I didn't pick it up till that afternoon the next day and it is perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, look at and this. And I didn't put it in anything. This just went into water. Um, so that's a tough plant. You know, it's almost an evergreen. Mm -hmm. um, now you'll also notice on these blooms here, uh, I think it's on this one, you can see where there is some freeze damage from the past freeze. Uh, okay, here, let me hold but, that out so Jesse can see it really well. But if you can just kind of get rid of this, you good, Jesse? You see that okay? Um, I mean, you can just pinch this out. Right. And it's still, you know. And I use them fine like to use. that. That's because, cute. Because people love green flowers. Mm -hmm. And so these will all turn green in a few months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's generally when I use them. 
because my brides are getting married in May and not in February or March. Mm -hmm. So all even the burgundies turn towards a green color. Yeah, they all sort of fade mm -hmm. a little bit as they're aging. And good grief. Okay, so this starts this starts coming out. Well, I know we're up in the mountains. It's a little bit cooler, longer. But the amount of time that this stays on the plant is really fantastic that it's usable as a cut. I mean, you really mm -hmm. have, into I, I would say, three. I use them into June. three months. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So their, their color tones and things are going to be changing throughout that uh, period. And the look of them, of course, will change. So let's see. Do we have any where, where the seed pods are maybe a little bit more Few. developed? The and there, and there is a reason why it's called Lenten Rose. It, it, it looks, it's at its peak during Lent. Which is now. And which is now. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I think one of the white ones has okay. a pot on it. Because they were a little earlier. So some of these will come in at different times. So you have to kind of look at the ones that work for your yard. Um, mm, I feel like this one might be kind of as close as we're going to oh, get right. in terms that's of right. time period right now. But these will actually swell out. So this is the female part of the plant. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's your ovary forming there. Mm -hmm. And then these are the male part of the plant. You can see the pollen popping off of them. So the pollen's popping down in here and then going down in. And these are going to then, these little parts right here, Jesse, they're very small right now. Hmm. That's right here. Can you see that? That's going to swell. Mm -hmm. So that's, make the, seeds. that's the ovary, and that's where the seeds will come on and live. So there's lots of different stages. So you can have it where it's, you know, actually in this book, there's tons of pictures in there I could show. There's a green seed pod and they're very usable with the green mm -hmm. seed pod on mm -hmm. them. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a picture of the life stages of the hellebore. And here is the part where, you know, this is what it's going to look out, look like late in the season once the seed pods have developed and ripened on the plant. Mm -hmm. But um, tell us a little bit, Susan, about this life cycle that we're looking at here. I know you mentioned four years to bloom on this. So if you're growing them in your yard and you let the seed pods drop the seeds, which you can barely see in the photo there, you should, in theory, have seedlings the next year. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be tiny. They're going to be like these little seedlings you see here. Now, you can move them, and probably the best time to move them is when they're that small. Oh, okay. They don't especially like being divided. Uh -huh. They don't especially like being moved. Okay. But the other important thing is once they get really big mm -hmm. and mature, mm -hmm. they make a better cut flower. Mm -hmm. So maybe that first year or so, you might not really expect those flowers to be great and hold kind of like well. a peony maybe like you know mm -hmm. that kind of three-year mark well for a lot of you grow a lot of perennials mm -hmm. three years is when they kind of have established and mm -hmm. they're doing well and so as far as bloom goes for those little guys that you might be wanting to do yourself mm -hmm. Don't expect to see anything for about four years. Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Big time. And that's why hellebores are not that commercially available. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or that inexpensive, right? If you're right. Buying. They are they are a more expensive plant, and there is a lot of there's a lot of time that's involved in babying those things. Unlike some of these annuals that you can pop up for pretty inexpensively at Lowe's or different things, like this um, this one here, uh, the pink frost. I think that that was maybe sixteen or eighteen dollars compared to mm -hmm. some of the other you know kind of quick annuals that they have or biannuals that they have that are coming and going. Yes, I saw some at Lowe's just yesterday, day before, uh -huh. $17 yeah. for just the standard Lowe's gallon pot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But they are, they're um, great when you can get them going and established. There's nothing else really happening in the garden at that time, That's you know, true. so it is that kind of like, I guess it, I sometimes I think I plant them more for myself because it's like, <laughs> oh, here's something, you know, spring is here. Um, Anything else that you wanted to share? I started growing them because all my brides were asking for green oh, okay. and green flowers. Right, right. So I needed something green, and uh -huh. there's only so many green flowers. Right. Mm -hmm. And in June and in May, perfect green flowers. Yeah, yeah. I also use the leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I leaves love these. Mm -hmm. These are so great. I'm not sure how you use them exactly, but I like to use them low in arrangements over the rim of the container to mm -hmm. frame. 
uh, some of the larger flowers and the leaves you can use all season long. Right. I might be just might destroying my plant by clipping from the leaves after they've bloomed maybe a little bit. <laughs> it's a big plant. I think they can handle it. They can it. handle it. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to share, um, again, this book, it's called Hellebores, A Comprehensive Guide. Um, Burl and Tyler are the authors on this, and it is one of the American Horticulture Society award-winning books. And you hop over, this was at the um, uh, Royal Horticulture Society Gardens in England, and whenever I was there, they have, this is one of the ones that they have in their library, but it's a comprehensive guide, and there's all kinds of great resources in here, and a lifetime of, uh, lifetime of work of several people that are kind of summarizing here, and also what we've got is, um, there's a plant trial back here that John Dole from NC State, uh, headed up in the appendix, which I guess I don't necessarily, there's a little nutrient study here and C. Uh, back here in appendix D of this book, there was a study that uh, Finelli and John Dole from NC State, the Department of Horticulture Science, put together a little experiment using hellebores as a cut flower and their results and you can see all of you know what with their control was and their temperature and all those kinds of things but 17 and a half days is where they landed they were experimenting um with cut flower preservatives so like the not the quick dip specifically but uh, those kinds of hydrating solutions and holding solution solutions versus when you're cutting the plant because for um most, a lot of people, and Susan, you know, would, I would consider one of them that cutting them later, you know, finds that there's really not, not a whole lot of problem mm -hmm. once they've got right. those seed pods on them. So that's what he was testing, you know, was, was there a notable difference between if the seed pods were developed versus if they weren't? And he didn't seem to find a, a major, difference. in this study, he didn't see a major difference, but it doesn't mean that there yeah, might like, not be for someone else. Like this one's starting to form a seed pod, so I would prefer to use one like that mm -hmm. because it's a little more leathery. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that it would last longer than one that still has all Very its delicate, anthers. Very soft. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, John was uh, using a hydrator solution mm -hmm. and um, a holding solution. A holding solution is a professional solution you can mm -hmm. get from Floral Life is the one he uses. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I think he did actually in this experiment. Crisol. I think he used yeah. I think he used both, like the kind of equivalents of mm -hmm. both brands, and didn't see a big difference. Basically, they have less sugar in them than the standard Floral Life sure. that you would get in the little packets. Mm -hmm. So that's really the main difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hydrator is just a solution you leave them in for several hours, mm -hmm. and it's similar to Quick Dip, mm -hmm. but the plant just, just sits a different in it brand. For a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, why do you think people? Why do you think that like higher sugar content that like you would get in a packet if you're buying mm -hmm. flowers from a florist or something? Mm -hmm. Why? Why wouldn't it be the lower sugar count if that actually mm -hmm. makes them last yes. longer? Yes, uh, because when you when you give somebody um, Regular floral life with a lot of sugar, that's mm -hmm. carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So that feeds the flower and it also makes it continue to mature. Okay. So if you're a, f a flower grower or a florist, you just want to hold that in stasis. So you just barely want to feed it. You don't want it to continue to mature okay. and you don't want to feed the bacteria. Of course, there's things in there to keep the bacteria from growing, mm -hmm. but that's why they give it very little sugar. Okay and then the home person gets the product with the sugar. Right, so then they're really seeing kind of the best parts of the plant and the, mm -hmm. the kind of rest of the life cycle of it, I guess. And most flowers are cut in bud, so mm -hmm. you want them to stay in bud till they get to where they're going. Right, and then that extra sugar lets them open. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for Thanks popping for on me. to join us today and to talk about hellebores a little bit. This has been really fun, and we're excited to share these uh, beautiful things with you. So best of luck on your hellebore planting that you have coming up and you let us know if you have any questions.